I'm tired. Will the butcher wake you up? Mm. What will it do for you? It's supposed to be good for my digestive tract. It's terrible for my taste buds. Nothing's good for my digestive tract, apparently, though. I cannot get my gut health on point. This is delicious. I love kombucha. Yeah, you know what? Kombucha is one of those things you either love or supremely dislike. Well, I guess we're rolling right into another episode of the Nameless Recovery Show. Yes. I'm Asta Wallace. Today with me is the famed Marcus Clark. Not famed. There's no fame. <laughs> There's literally the, zero the, fame. The renowned There's no Marcus renowned. Clark. The, neither one of those are true. The esteemed, the herald, the widely known, revered, feared, and respected Marcus Clark. Ladies and gentlemen. None of those things are true. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the office. <laughs> <laughs> So the Nameless Recovery Show is getting done in the dark today. Well, not in the dark. It seems like we're in the dark. To them, it's not the dark. Should we whisper? No. Is that weird? Yeah. Okay. I won't whisper. Nobody wants to hear whispers in their cars. (laughs) Driving around, looking at some dudes whispering in the dark. They're like, what the fuck? They're not, hopefully, if you're driving, don't (laughs) look at anything right now. (laughs) It's official. If you're driving, just listen. Yeah, audio only. Audio specifically. Well, so Marcus Clark, you are Chief Operating Officer of a treatment center, Cornerstone Healing Center. Mm-hmm. It's great to have you. Um, so you're a professional, you work in the industry, you're also in recovery yourself. Mm-hmm. Tell me what, before you got into recovery, personally, or obviously you got into it personally before you got into it professionally, but before you got into recovery, what was your? Did you have a view of what drug addicts look like? No idea. None. Did you ever? Did it even cross your mind? What about alcoholics? No, nothing. You didn't have a view of what that is. I knew nothing about that. When's the first time you heard the word drug addict, and you were like, March tenth of two thousand and eleven. What happened on March tenth? Before I got sober. And they were like, what? what you did had they to say, say you were an alcoholic when you walked into the meeting. Was that uncomfortable? I didn't know. I didn't know. I had no idea. I don't know what that meant. I didn't come from a life where that was a thing. That's not, it was never, I never heard of AA. I didn't know about alcoholics. I didn't know about drug addicts. I didn't know about anything. It wasn't, it wasn't a thing. People smoke, I saw crackheads in South Carolina, but that's it. I had no idea what a drug addict or an alcoholic was, or had never even really What do crackheads in South Carolina look like? Crackheads everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> crackhead's a crackhead. Not really. Jerry Garcia smoked a lot of crack. Well, you know. You um, look like a crackhead. You look like a Homeless hippie. dudes. Dudes experiencing homelessness. Um, Let's talk about that. Dudes, dirty. people experiencing homelessness versus homeless people. Why do you say that? <laughs> That's because I was a social worker. Well, yeah, but so social stigma. workers. Stigma. So give me, give me some background. Why? What's the difference between homeless people and people experiencing homelessness? Homeless person separates you from other people. How? You're homeless. I'm not homeless. You're homeless. I can't be like you because you're that thing. Same thing as what people say. You're you're a drug addict. Drug addicts. It's like anybody could become homeless. Interesting concept. So anybody could become homeless. So they at any given point, somebody could be experiencing homelessness. Yes. Yeah. But you judge a person by that though too. Yeah. You're, he's a. That's his defining marker is the fact that he doesn't have a home. It's like a biomarker. It's like a birthmark. Right. When it's not true, he could have been successful. Oh, he's a it? homeless dude. Yeah. He could have a mental health issue. He could be a drug addict. It could be a million things. So it's just like taking out, that stigma. You ever sleep outside? Yeah, a bunch of times. You don't look homeless. No. <laughs> not right, but uh, apparently I transitioned from being a homeless person to, to being, not a, being a homed person. A homed person. It's like that didn't make any sense. It's a misnomer. It, it is. It makes a kids feel like they don't. Well, his name's not Steve. He's a homeless person. Well, and I, I, I've always found it interesting that you say that because it's not about political correctness as much as it's more about stigma. Yeah, like if it, was, <clears throat> if it was PC, I wouldn't be saying it. PC right. is like saying something so you don't have people say something against you. I get more flack. So for people saying, don't get, leave you negative comments right, on your tweets. Right. I get more <laughs> flack from saying people experiencing homelessness. Than get, <laughs> like no one cares. All right. Well then. What the actual fuck is going on in the world? There are 
more people dying every day of drugs and alcohol than ever before in history. This is July of late July of 2020. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are through the roof. What's going on out there? More people, why are more people dying? Yeah, I mean, in 2015, it was like, oh, opioid crisis, opioid epidemic. We're gonna get a handle on this thing. And the numbers have just escalated every year. 2018, we started passing legislation, things started changing policy, and it's getting worse still. You mean with the epidemic or just why are people experiencing, like it's void of epidemic, people would still be dying at a higher rate than? Hard to say, but that's where it's at. I mean, we've got this coronavirus thing going, so I have no doubt that contributes to it, but what, what, what is it, what is causing so many people to die? I don't know, I mean, I, I have my ideas, but... That's what I want to know. I want to know your ideas. A million reasons. We're a culture that's set apart. We're, we have very, uh, like... The American culture is very isolated. It's an isolated culture. People don't go outside. People don't talk to their neighbors. There's no connectedness in the community. It's a lot. Not, let me not say there is none. There is some, but... We, as Americans, have a higher rate of diabetes we have for for a fourth level four country we have um what's it called with uh babies that are born die when they're born mortality the mortality child mortality, child mortality rate. rate is really high in this country for for a level four country um we have huge houses for small groups of people think about what our ideals of what a lot of space is it's true. Suicide rates are high. Suicide rates are high in level four countries across the world. Though. Right. But you'd think that GDP growth would be like people are more happy, but it's not true. And yeah, people thought that for a long time. It's not even connected. If we could just solve all of our it's just like everything. environmental problems, we would be happy. We could just, life would flourish. Civic, civic unity would occur and we could focus on art and education and music. There's but you're right, that, that hasn't really that's happened. That's from the book. Which one, Sapiens? No, your the big book. Oh, is it's exactly it? what it says. Well, it talks about that the, the pros, the prosaic steel girder, the steel girder. Right. Yeah. That's well, what they but I mean, that. a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of people that think have thought that in decades past. Like once we, once we get past this industrial revolution, or once we get past the, now uh, the technology, the, techno the technology revolution, things will be so much better. We'll be able to focus on the things that really matter in life. But the truth is, people are still people. I think it'll become more integrated. I what think technology won't, right now the biggest problem with technology is the interface. Expand on that. Interface, this is my input. So I'll have all of, right here in my hand, I have more knowledge in this, I have all of the words, anything I wanna know, literally. The slowest part of this transaction is the bandwidth of the internet. Where it, well, that's not the slowest part, but the slowest part is my thumbs. Right. I can only type so fast and I can only read so fast. So right now, the interface that we have to have with technology is cumbersome. That's why they're building Google Homes and Siri and so the, it's seamless. When you wake up, you think what the weather is, it shows you what the weather is. Eventually, technology will be more integrated into our daily lives to where it's more natural. On one hand, you have, on one hand, you have the, the, beneficial parts of technology revolution. We have the possibility of smart cities, completely seamless integration mm -hmm. of, of uh, you know, the Internet of Things, you know, from our computers to our cars, mm -hmm. to our air conditioning, to the way we access information for education, for everything. Kombucha. Just kombucha. Just to let them know. Delivered. I just want the people to know that this is oh. kombucha. Oh. Um, yeah, he likes the booch. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's that. That's the, that's the positive side, right? medical advancements, you can go on and on about the benefits of integrating everything uh, with technology. The drawback, and the one I'm hearing more and more lately, especially since during you know, 2020 we've had, ever since the coronavirus has kind of changed the way the entire world operates, every, not everyone, many people have been pushed slash forced slash encouraged into this, uh, in these digital platforms mm -hmm. to continue connecting even, you know, even though we're not in person. Mm -hmm. And I would, I've heard a lot of people saying lately, and I think goes all the way down the line with technology, and I think that's why some people have feared it even from the beginning and why some people have never taken to social media. And that is the theory that the more we create technology to connect us, it does the opposite. 
yeah. it puts us further apart. I don't think technology to connect us is what will connect us. I think technology will become so normal and so integrated in our lives that we will spend more time connecting one on one. Because we live in a society where, and we went way off the subject of what's happening, but it, we'll wrap it back around hopefully. You're a glass um, half full kind of guy right now and I like it. What will happen is, is that that technology, the interface, which makes it hard to connect, the, Zoom sucks. Right. Zoom's garbage. I don't to connect on Zoom. Zoom's a horrible way to connect to people. It is. There's a whole set of memes now and YouTube videos and <laughs> GIFs and everything talking crap about Zoom because it sucks for connection. It does. It's There's too many things that we pick it's up. It's better than nothing. Off. For those of you that are watching boys and girls, if you can't get out to get to a meeting for whatever reason and a Zoom meeting is the best you can do, do that. Oh yeah, whole different subject than Zoom meetings. But, but, if, like, but officially, I it mean, sucks. it sucks. You couldn't have this conversation via Zoom because you can't pick up on certain cues. No. You can't. You, you talk over each other because you can't really decipher when someone's it's speaking. Worse. There's so many ways that speaking via a two-dimensional object is way harder than speaking via a three-dimensional object and the fact that we can pick up naturally on each other's like cues. Yeah. You can feel it. You can't pick that up via a TV screen. Well, we did that presentation for 200 veterinarians. Yeah, it was only and half we couldn't as good see, as we a couldn't see anybody. No. You you're pitching to yourself. It's weird. Essentially. It was it was super weird. But I think that will be that day will be gone. It's like the movie. Uh, what was the big blockbuster digital movie about the the colony that we invaded? They were all blue. I don't remember. Oh, uh, Avatar. How their technology was so built into their world. It's organic. Right. We will get to a stage of how organic. the ponytail sinks with the horse's ponytail. Right. Like we will get Shit's to a dope. we'll get to a level of organic technology and it. And we'll spend more time in things that matter because eventually people won't work anymore. Where my where I can grow a little rat tail, it'll connect to my car. I mean, we'll be gone long. And they're already doing it with Neuralink. <laughs> Neuralink. You'll get in. You won't even. You won't even drive your car. You'll get in a car. It'll drive you to where you need to do. You'll spend more of your life connecting with people rather than trying to. Because we have to. <clears throat> I have to spend half my time producing for people who aren't in my immediate family. You have to spend a large portion of your life producing for people who aren't in your immediate family or even in your tribe of people. So the amount of energy that you have to put out to produce for even more, it's like if I work for BMW, I'm building cars for the world. When we were hunter gatherer, I was just producing for my small band. So I wasn't spending 40 hours a week working. I was spending 10. I wouldn't hunt it because I was a hunter and we hunt it once a week and you were a hunter-gatherer and you spent four hours a day gathering nuts and berries and you made clothes and we provided for each other and we didn't spend 40 hours of our time doing something. We spent a lot smaller percentage of our time doing something. Would, I, would my, st my head still look like this or would it just be really long and scraggly and thin? Probably, I don't know. I don't terrible. know what hunter-gatherers would look like. You only live to be like 20, don't you? Right, I'm what not saying their society was better. <laughs> We've definitely increased that, but it's like the give and flow, the ebb and flow. You want to get you you work really hard. What do you All right, so what do you think that's going to do? What do you think as we continue to uh, advance technologically and we have more and more opportunities to make things like information flow simpler? Can we go back to having 12 step meetings in person? Is that going to happen? Is that a thing? Yeah, we'll definitely have meetings in person. Luckily, we rehabs are still in person. Yeah, of course you'll have meetings in person. <clears throat> well, so what do you think's what do you think's going on out there? So you so you you you've 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 built a case that there's so much going on in the world. We've got you know we're, right we're now a country we're that has isolated. everything. We're very very isolated as a country, as a as our culture in our in the it's U.S. The only thing that so us. we're consumers. It's buy, 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 more, more, more makes you happy. You remember those days? Mm -hmm. So that's what that's what you think. That's what you think is a big contributing factor to so many people it's dying backwards. from it's drug addiction. It's such a, our world is backwards. We're taught backwards. My parents taught me backwards. They didn't teach me how to. I could now. You can enjoy having a family, but before then you couldn't. You even if you had it, you still be getting loaded. You did it. You had to learn the opposite way around. You had to learn how to feel yourself, feel connected to the world. So that when you had a family, you could be grateful for it. You had to learn to be grateful for what you have, like live in gratitude. And then when you earned something, you felt something from it rather than 
get all the stuff, the feelings come second, the feelings come first, and the things that you acquire as a result of this feeling have meaning. It's a it's a backwards world. So so many kids, and that's what we do here is we teach them how to think the opposite way. Hey, don't worry about a house and a car and a job because whatever the unemployment rate's eleven percent now. So nine out of ten people have the stuff you're worried about. You're literally worrying about your God-given right as an American. <laughs> That's what you're worried about. I'm it's not going to get the thing that it's everyone true, though. gets. New, sobri- new sobriety, not for all people, but for many people, people that come in, especially younger people that haven't had a career and they don't have much of an education or maybe they're mid-education. Yeah. yeah, they come in pretty much destitute, probably living off mom and dad if they're lucky enough. And yeah, have very little and they are very concerned about where am I going to live, where am I going to work? Yet dudes missing meetings, missing commitments because they got they got some fifteen dollar an hour job, and it's like, dude. <laughs> and their parents are crying. They have a house and a car and money and a job, and their parents are crying mm-hmm. because all they want is connection for their kid. Complete opposite. Two people living in the same house, living opposite lives because them and their parents have probably never had a real conversation about anything with any depth. My parents didn't. Still to this day, can't have a real conversation with my mom about anything. To this day, deep, meaningful about something more than just external stuff. So I didn't have a teacher. Your parents didn't. Probably you didn't have a great relationship with your mom until you got sober. Yeah. And then you built this relationship built off you building connection with her. And it wasn't like she, she just didn't know that you didn't have that internal thing. She didn't know that you were missing that. She thought I think, that, I that think, was I think you're. I think you're nailing on the head. I had a relationship. For the very first time, I had a strong relationship, communication, honesty, some level of vulnerability with my sponsor. And he really coerced me into that, coaxed me into it. And from there, I had rebuilt relationships with my family, with some of my older friends that I'd known since grade school, and then with new relationships, was able to forge deep, meaningful relationships. He modeled the first relationship you ever mm-hmm. had, built off respect, honesty, and trust, and love. Mm-hmm. And now you were able to model that relationship. And my parents, and a lot of people in this in our country, miss the boat because they believe, they don't know that for kids like me and you, people like us, we don't have that built in. We need that, that connection taught to us and taught that that's the most important thing and everything else is secondary. I never knew that. I thought if I got went to college and I went to college and mm-hmm. I got a job and a girlfriend and made money, I'd be happy and I never was. And I think there's, because it's easy to blame that on culture and you're not wrong by saying that, but I think each of us has responsibility because we all make up the culture. So I think it's each of us but that's that individualism. And I'm not yeah. arguing, but that's the American thought process. Right, well, I think as individuals, we, we, need, we need to take, the re- take on the responsibility of every person we come in contact with, showing them the other perspective. But can I ask you a question? Yes. So I like that so you say it's, A, you're like, I can see how you can blame it on culture, right? And B, you're like, I think that it's on us individually. Mm-hmm. But AA teaches us the opposite. They tell us it's the group we. The first thing you get it is, sober it's, with. Oh, but the but the group is based off of in, is made of individuals. Right, but you don't see so yourself we each have like a, that. We each have responsibility, and together we make up the culture. So, like, why don't we have that thought process in our culture as Americans? It's the opposite, because in AA, some it's, people do, but not. But it's not everybody. Right, it's not taught that. You you like to go vacation where? Lots of places, Europe. But but the where you you have your home at Norway. Norway. They're a culture together. Yes. There's a Norwegian culture. And in their culture, it's like almost their job to be helpful, help your neighbors, be connected with. They're pretty nice people. Take yeah. care of your entire community. They didn't have a word for homelessness. Nicole told me that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I don't you know, know Norwegian language well enough to tell you. But that. that's such a different thought process. And then AA taught me that. Hey man, good job for doing what you do. And I always said this, I've always said it my entire story. Oh, that's just what we do. Like, I don't think I'm a good dude for doing this. This is what we do. This is what I mean. Everybody does this. What That dude had eight dudes in his car. What do you mean? He just got his car last week and he was picking up dudes mm-hmm. across the valley. Agreed. I learned this. I, that's what I, I learned it in 12 step fellowships as well. Who learned that as a kid? I didn't. 
I didn't learn that you're supposed to go if I wish my mom would have been like, hey, so you have a car, you need to go pick up all these kids. That's part of what you do, Marcus, is you help drive people. Drive to school. You drive them to drive school. Drive the other kids in our neighborhood and your class to school. If they ask you for gas money, you say no. If you see a kid with dirty tennis shoes, mm -hmm. tell me, because apparently his parents don't have food or money. Let's go give him some food, and then I'll help buy that kid some shoes. So I love that. I love that. Bob, my heart. So flipping the script from culture to individualism, that's where you and I have the opportunity to do that with our kids. Right. I agree that... And with the and with the people the, with the men that we bring into recovery, hundred percent. I agree. I just think thinking the individual first, that that's the individual responsibility, lends us to the to continuing to perpetuate the same problem that we do in our culture. It should be more. If we're Americans and our job is to take care of each other, then we do. We if you see somebody that doesn't have money at the store, you pay you help them. If you see somebody, how many times do you know somebody struggling now when you help, but how many times have I not? I see somebody struggling and it's not, oh, you know what, that's not my job. Somebody else to help this individual, somebody else to take care of that. Oh, maybe it's, there's the dude, the, the, and this is what stood out to me, the dude. So it's this movie called The Bridge, and I'm going to warn y'all, do not watch this movie if you are sad. <laughs> you heard <laughs> the about tear it. The tearjerker? No, I haven't The Bridge, it's the movie that when I did my uh, suicide training, on how to like talk to people when they're talking about committing suicide. Mm -hmm. They make you watch the movie The Bridge. Is it about the Golden Gate Bridge? Where people jump off. Okay. Dudes crying. I actually have heard of it. Balling. I have not seen it. Balling next to the bridge. Guess what people are doing? Driving by. Walking. Walking by? Walking. Walking by him. They don't say anything? Nothing. It's a culture. If you, how many times have you seen a dude crying you walk right by? I have. Because I'm not going to blame, it's the truth. Like, we walk by a lot of times. Well, this isn't really a walking city, so I don't walk that much. But if you see... I can't understand what you're saying. You see somebody, you just walk by. Ad admittedly, um, I drove by at least three people experiencing homelessness this morning on the way to work. And sleeping at three different bus stops in order, which is interesting. Because this part of town, you don't typically see people not sleeping at, at bus stops. But it's three in a row. It's becoming worse now. Yeah, three in a row. You don't need the news to tell you that. No. Use your eyes to tell you we got a, home, a problem with people experiencing homelessness. Yes. And it's getting worse in there. Homelessness is on the rise. In Houses are growing more expensive. People are experiencing more homelessness. Weird. And admittedly, I drove by them, looked at them, observed them, and thought, I don't have the calories it takes to help solve that. So, yeah, I mean... So yes, I get it. We pay people to do it. Yeah, I mean, and we do help people in that capacity to a degree. 100%. But it's not necessarily every person I pass by we on the street. We create jobs for it. We got social workers, dog. It's true. We don't need, you need my <laughs> responsibility. Let me, how many people will figure out who they can call before what they can do? That's, now we're talking about a very, <clears throat> a very sore subject for a lot of cities. But, it's getting worse in Arizona, but I mean, particularly bad in California. There's, there's so many people living homeless and many of them are either suffering with addiction or they're suffering with mental illness, severe mental illness. And they've, they've simply slipped through the cracks. They've gotten to a point where not enough people give a shit enough and that's just the way they live. It's, I mean, this might be controversial, but let's defund the police rather than what I can do as an individual. We're blamers. My teacher, my kid's teacher sucks. We need to change the whole school system. You know what? The problem's the teachers. It's, it's, it's the te they're a bad teacher. My kid, it couldn't be my parenting. That could be the issue here. It's definitely, what? Why don't I look at my, it's like, and this is a, it's like a cold, hard, whole, it's a cold, hard examination of ourselves. And you ask me what's wrong with why we're getting increased alcohol and drug addiction why are we as people willing to write more prescriptions? Because doctor's got 15 minutes, he's gotta make his money. So he's gonna give him the thing instead of sitting and talking with the dude, he's gonna write him a prescription. It's, we, easier. it's the same, it's all of it's the same. It's calling the social worker rather than helping the guy with a, with a bite to eat and maybe help him neighbor answer some, qu answer some questions. Before they lose their house. Helping your neighbor's kid when you see him struggling. You got your three, four, five kids at your house and they're teenagers 
and they go lock themselves in the room and you go downstairs and watch the TV channel show you want to watch because you don't want to deal with them because you don't want to get to know this 15 year old who's going to become a drug addict even though you see signs of your own kid or someone else's kid and you don't do anything I don't do anything I just do with my stuff because I'm an individual and you know what they'll figure it out and it's like but then we're gonna be quick to blame everybody else and we talk about it all the time how our society is quick to blame and like disregard and make mean posts and comments about 100%. people standing up for themselves particularly this year so when I talk about it so I agree with you it is uh, this year has been uh, a very shameful example in our culture of blaming of every every possible from every possible angle politically opioid epidemic let's do something and no one does anything Everyone personally does shit. but we just vote personally. a lot <laughs> okay i agree so <laughs> like what so when i think individualism i think each one of us takes our own responsibility and, it, and we can't all take our own personal responsibility on every issue but no. we can take responsibility for the issues that affect us and, and affect our kids and our neighbors and our yeah. friends but i think Thinking that way is the it's backwards. Think of us as connected people that are together. And as a result of me not seeing you as different, but seeing you just as me, as another person in this world, I will then do something different. Because that's what the AA taught us. It taught us that it just switched it. It switched our thinking. I'm gonna get myself sober to know we get sober together. We get sober together. And if you switch that, it's your responsibility to fucking do what you need to do to help people to it's our responsibility to help each other. It's the same thing, but it switches my logic. And we are very R-based people, to a fault. Like we, we are so R-based that we have to turn ourselves off. Not R and letter R and not R and A-R-E, but O-U-R. And I'm from South Carolina, that's why I say R. But to like, we think about every decision that we make as a company, we think about how it affects everyone. Every decision we make fiscally, we think about how it affects everyone. Every decision we make to bring in a client, we think about how it affects everyone. And probably to a fault. And we have to fight with that more than we do with helping people. We have to be like, sometimes we got to stop. <laughs> and not just help every single person. That, that would be an path. amazing American problem. Like, hey guys, y'all yeah. got to quit helping people. <laughs> hey, just how about you worry about yourself right now instead of always having to raise money and do charities and it's all we ever have to do and everybody just wants to give a dollar to a problem and rather than spend time it's like well it's true it's much easier to fall in love with the pitch from a commercial an advertisement something i saw on social media or uh or something my uh my friend or my boss is all fired up about rather than actually research an issue form my own opinion independently and then contribute in whatever way is manageable and meaningful for me. And I can't, and again, I can't do that with everything, but <clears throat> with addiction, I can do that. Mm -hmm. With racism, I can do that. Mm -hmm. With sexism. <clears throat> with sexism, I can do that. With my neighbor. Absolutely. You need anything with somebody at the store? With homelessness, with people living homeless in this city, I can do it to a degree, but it's pretty small. But again, if it's just me, that's, I mean, I shouldn't try to put a label on it, whether it's good or bad. It is what it is. I don't want to pat myself on the back. I've gotten some dudes like you have from being homeless to being inside. And, but that's not by no means what we do for a living. It's not what we do all day, every day. And I certainly wouldn't want to measure up how many people I've done that for or you've done that for against an organization whose sole purpose is to do that. But if every person did that, instead if, of, we wouldn't need organizations to do it. And it goes into, this dude talked about it, our obsession with superhero movies. It's an American obsession with the it superhero. Is. We want there to be one dude that fixes everything and saves us, rather than me taking the responsibility of doing it myself. I need you to save me. The, the officer didn't do his job because he didn't. The firefighter didn't. He, he used to put out each other's homes if somebody's house caught on fire. You know, like that's, I don't know. I just really, like that really honestly to me is what is causing I don't think you can because if you want to systematize it and fix each system that's broken you're gonna fix 12 million systems I think if you change well, and the then way how many and then how many iterations of each system and who the and who the fuck votes on that it's gonna be it's each one's a shit show waiting to happen we'll never get anything done 
It's true. We'll continue to, to vote to talk about the, the opioid epidemic, which we did, and it actually got worse. And we're going to continue to take butt loads of mon- truckloads of money and throw it at the com- this problem and continue to have the same problem. It's like, what if you would have talked to your kid when he was 12 and he was sitting at home and he felt isolated and he was miserable and you didn't know what to do, but you researched it instead of just taking him to a professional off the bat. You would have researched him ADD it. medication? Mm-hmm. It's, it's tricky, man. We get into this place where so many things are offered to us, they're productized. They're, they're wrapped up in a bow and say, oh, this is, this is how we treat mental health. This is how we treat addiction over here. And I think as people that work in that space, <clears throat> we are so used to the cleanup. We're so used to damage repair that we don't, we meaning not just as a professional, as a community, we don't really think about prevention. Dare doesn't fucking work. Uh-uh. Well, At we, least they were thinking about it, but it didn't. It didn't do shit. Because dare was the drop. That was it. My kid learned dare. I don't got to talk about drugs. Right. And, Birds there you, and, and the there, there's the product. Here's prevention. Why does the school have to do drugs? Shouldn't somebody do something about all this drug drug addiction? Why don't we have a prevention effort? We just keep sliding we'll have, everything let's, to schools. Let's have let's have police officers go in and, and try to try to convince them not to do drugs. Talk to my kids about sex. How about the schools do that? Teach my kids how to exercise. They got PE. What else can I slide somewhere else to teach my <laughs> human that I, I brought into the world how to be a part of the world? Who else can I pawn off this piece of my life to? And this is a, and what you're proposing, I think, is, I think has a lot of merit. I also think it's really tricky. Bar- there's plenty of countries who do that are way more connected as a unity. True. As a group. I'm, I'm just thinking about, I'm thinking about parenting in 2020 in America. It's, it's <clears throat> besides the fact that we've got all the dangers of big city life in major cities, you've got social media, all the, all the technological dangers, and we most, I wouldn't say not say most, many parents, if there's two parents in the home, they're both working. And, if, and, then there, and there are many that are just single parent families, in which case the parent is working. So you get minimal interface time with the child or oh, children. Nice. So how, how, and these are questions even for myself as a parent, you know, I've got kids. How do I as a parent spend the appropriate amount of time talking about the appropriate information, those, those critical learning moments, those Starts formative years? That. What's that? Starts before that. There's prep and prep on prep. Before I have a kid, I look at my lifestyle. I make decisions based off, I'm gonna bring a person into a world is this person going to be appropriately able to deal with it? Am I in an appropriate situation to be able to take on this duty? It's all. It doesn't. The the ownership doesn't just start at the kid. Then we're going to have the same problem. You thought about what it was going to be like to raise a kid many years before you had a kid. Yeah. So it goes into we us thinking about each other. It goes into that. If <clears throat> I have your kids are going to learn that this is how you're supposed to be raised before you have kids. You talk to dad and then you ask him questions about like what it's like to be a parent and then you prep before you have a kid because you were raised with parents who prep before you had kids. Oh, you're making me sad. I wish my parents were here and we could talk about parenting. And it's just like that. I mean, I wish I could talk to my parents about parenting. <laughs> but it, it it's, it's just that whole thing, man. I, I watched in Barcelona where people, they stopped at the corner and they talked to people. It blew my mind. You didn't see anybody in restaurants with phones. You go to a restaurant, nobody's on their phone. You sat and you ate and you sat at benches and you talked to people. Populated city. Huge amounts of city life. And everybody had dogs and they saw each other's neighbors and they waved and they knew their neighbors and it was just different. They, there's plenty of cities who have, are extremely populated who don't have drug addiction to the level that we do. Or so, I mean, think about Japan and the suicide rate in Japan. Yeah. Isolated people who don't have connection with each other, and yeah. we need connection. We talk about it all the time. Yeah, it's important. It's the most important thing for humans to have connection. Can't rip it apart, and you can't replace it with technology. That was a. Uh, th- first of all, that was fucking amazing. That was a really long, great answer to a very simple, simple but hard to answer question. 
why is addiction out of control in 2020? And isolation is a good answer. More than, more than ever, I think, in this last few months, obviously, people are more isolated than they've been, even in an isolated culture, or even more isolated this last, most of this last year. And we have to have, watch commercials telling us to call our friends. I just, it blows my mind that that's even a commercial. Have you seen those? No, I don't watch much uh, hey, if, television. With, I know every, with and it's all, com, it's all big companies. Like mm-hmm. if you're struggling and, you know, pick up the phone and call your friends and check them. Like, why do you need to teach me that? Because unfortunately there are people that haven't heard that. I just put a video on Instagram uh, yesterday, the day before, telling people to do that. But we all give each other high fives and like videos. But then what are we doing? I ask dudes all the time when I go to a meeting. I'm, we're gonna, you're going to get here? And then people are going to say some dope stuff, and you're going to hear some amazing speakers talk about trials and tribulations and struggling through to get sober, and then you're going to go home and cut your TV on. And you're going to go back to sober living and play cards with your boy. Or you're going to just... Play Halo until 4 a.m. Right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, but... Yeah, the, the way the tools that are taught in recovery are supported is practical application. Spe- you know, meetings, 12 step meetings are just where people in recovery come to, to share experience, strength, and hope. They listen to each other, they talk to each other, they network with each other. What do we have them sit in all day? Meeting before the meeting. What's that? What do we have our clients sit in all day here? Group. Which is what? Socialization, not isolation. That's all we teach these dudes. Hey, how do I stay sober? That's not all we teach them. But you know, it's <laughs> the majority of what we do. Yes. We deal with family systems mm-hmm. more than. Anything else, how you were raised, what happened, okay, let's deal with that. Let's teach you healthy family systems. Let's mimic healthy relationships in your life. Let's teach you how to connect with people. And let's teach you how to like look at yourself and make accurate assessments of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Learn how to love your neighbors, tolerate differences of opinion, get up on time, go to bed on time, exercise your body. Welcome to life. Welcome to adult oh, adulthood. It's, it's hard. That's beautiful. Welcome to the beautiful struggle you get to have (laughs) it's a gorgeous experience man when you actually are in it man it's just i never was for 25 years i never felt consistent i never felt connection i can think back on my life isolated and alone i lived 25 years before i ever lived one day can't even you can't put your days in crying from your daughters at the nothing did you see her jump in the water? Marcus, look at the video. <laughs> She's jumping in. Oh my God. <laughs> what? How much more connected to the world can you be? <laughs> right. People don't get that. They miss that. I missed that for 25 years. Me too. I had no idea. I actually deluded myself into thinking that I didn't need people. You well, of course not, because you couldn't find connection. Uh uh-uh. uh. You should. So I had to convince myself I didn't need it. Right? I think addiction. Addiction can work that way because it's all, it's primarily between the ears. And I could, I could, can, if some, if I couldn't get something to work, I would convince myself that was useless. Mm-hmm. Finances, family system, mm. love, connection. I'm going to find that connection self, in drugs. Self care. That's what we're looking for when we're getting loaded, is that mm-hmm. connection. And drugs gives us that connection, makes us feel. I thought it was in addition to, but it was actually in place of. Mm-hmm. And then years went by. Mm hmm. You strip drugs now, call away, and you have a you have a fucking dysfunctional adult that <laughs> doesn't know how to live, doesn't know how to love, doesn't know how to receive love. Argues with you about love. Mm-hmm. You're just trying to save them, and they're just like, no, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I'm like, all right, buddy. Good luck, man. You sound miserable. Misery is just part of life. Are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. I don't sound happy. Are you happy? Right. Yeah. Come hang well, out. I have a lot of joy in my life. I mean, happiness, I suppose, if you want to be semantical, happiness can be something that comes and goes. But my life is, my life is full and it's rich and it's full of joy. And not, not everything is, you know, a rainbow, but all of it's real. It's not. And I don't want to trade any of it. It's all authentic. None of it's counterfeit. I'm sad and happy. I'm not sad and then use synthetic things to make me happy. Right. So I can have that variation. <laughs> Use synthetic things to block out the sadness. Right. <laughs> to I'm dull the pain. Looking for that variation, and I'll have it. I never had it. And I know that some people start that way. They start with like trying to numb pain or get away from that. And I mm-hmm. get that, especially people who have had traumatic childhood experiences. I got to tell you, even if some of that was present, 
when I started getting loaded, I was I was trying to add to. I was like, this is this, this is so much cooler when I'm baked, and I was trying to take that approach to getting loaded, and it became what you just described. It became where I needed to get fucked up to just to just manage in the poor way I can manage every day. But you never really talked about that stuff growing up either. No. You weren't ready for it. No. Yeah, I. Well, keep the keep the responsibility on me. I, I was not ready to talk about it, not honestly. Mm, I like how you protect them. Well, they have their own part. I love my family, really. but I don't protect them. It's like, hey, you fucked up. It's okay. I'm gonna fuck up. <laughs> but I was like, you did. I mean, I don't know if that would have stopped me from being a drug addict, but it would have definitely prepared me more for life. Well, I look. I would def. I I would. I've said this before, and I'll say it now. I did not grow up in a household where we talked about much that was very deep. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in a household where we just, if, if it was good, we talked about it. If it was bad, we just didn't really talk about it. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, there'd be a come to Jesus talk over bad grades or something that was very serious, but it was usually pretty poignant and right short. Like if, if finally my dad had to say something. You couldn't go on a journey with them. No, 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 no. We didn't get into, we didn't talk like this. Think this is I didn't talk like this with anybody. But that's like human nature. Until I got until I got into recovery. I used to sit around the fire and people would tell stories and you'd ask <laughs> questions. And they I would, love the visuals I get when you with your uh, with your analogies. I just your... like to think about human nature as a whole, man. And that's like that is the most important part of like us is this thing in our head, and you need someone to navigate that that waters with. That's that's what it's about is navigating with. I like that. I like the way that feels. I, I like the vision of that. Fucking crazy up here without people. Because it's not like you guide me through it or I guide you through it. It's like we help guide each other. Because we're not all we're not all struggling with the same thing at the same time. Yet we all struggle with the same things over lengths of time. More often than not, there is not a right answer. No, life's super dynamic. Mm-hmm. Everything's a moving target. It's just that time, man. Giving up the most precious one, gift you have. One size fits all t-shirts don't fucking work for anything. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't fit anybody. They cover you. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right. They work it as a wash rag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one size fits all t-shirts don't fit anybody very well. That's the... <clears throat> and I think that... I think the breakdown of that compartmentalized, productized way of thinking, I think that can turn the tide on what we've been calling the opioid epidemic or just the the, the addiction the 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 stream of addiction death that we've suffered as a as a species for a long time that's just gotten so much worse i think if we could not if we could i think as we continue to have real conversations about what drugs and alcohol are what they do because look drugs and alcohol are awesome right they're fucking fun you know fucked up with your friends Mm -hmm. the trouble is when that gets out of hand typically it gets so far out of hand that by the time a person decides for themselves, not like, hey, you should do something about this. When they think to themselves, like, oh, fuck, this is getting out of hand. They usually, they're usually too far gone to do anything about it. And next thing you know, that's how they live their lives. Why do you think, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Why do you think we as an institution, and I mean us treatment centers, the things that we really focus on in treatment, right? Why do you think we avoid telling people the truth about what's causing it? Even though we spend all this time trying to fix it on the back end, why do we not say, hey, the reason that people are struggling or this addiction problem continues to be perpetuated? Because we all know it. We all do ACA. We all do trauma treatment. We do, well, not all of us. The good facilities do ACA right. and trauma treatment. And we look at the whole person's life and we build, teach them how to build connection. Why do, it doesn't seem like us as an industry are willing to tell people like, hey, the reason that this is a problem is because you guys haven't been doing some stuff right. Why are we, why do we kind of, we always tiptoe, even with families, we tiptoe around those subjects with people. We don't want to be too straightforward. Well, here's the answer I can give you that I, here's my answer. Prevention, first and foremost, is tricky. How do we effectively communicate with young people who have just begun or not even yet quite begun to experiment with drugs and alcohol? 
how do we how do we effectively communicate to them what the real dangers are? Because it's not like what about the before the before though before prevention. Prevention's right. late. Do you want to know why we don't do it, or do you want do you want what is likely a a semi accurate answer of what how do you to feel? Do it? Whatever you want, however you want to answer. Well, I think we don't approach it because it's fucking hard. It's so it's 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 probably as or more multifaceted and complicated a problem as is solving an addiction later in life. To, to actually work with, so it begins with parenting. It begins with how a human being is raised. 100%. So how a human being is raised doesn't necessarily determine hard and fast that they're gonna become a drug addict, but statistically, it skews in that direction. That should be a slogan. What? Ending addiction begins with parenting. So, statistically speaking, like let's talk, talk about ACE testing, adverse childhood experience mm-hmm. testing. Now, you could, for anybody that doesn't know, ACE test, just Google it, ACE testing, adverse childhood experience test. It's a series of 10 questions. You get one point for each question that you answer yes to, zero points for every question you answer no to. Drug addicts score very, very high on this test. Yes, so 10 is give or take about as, about as fathomable as a child can be abused and all the way down to zero. So a lot of people fall anywhere on the spectrum that you can imagine. Now, anybody who tests four and higher, the propensity for them to be uh, addicted to substances, drugs or alcohol, is something like 75 or 80%. So again, it doesn't mean that if you scored a 10 on an ACE test that you are guaranteed to be a drug addict. This is again, it's just testing. Just puts you in a percentage that more than likely. Statistically, it's not yeah. good. So we can use that as an indication. So parenting and, and childhood upbringing plays a significant role. Environmental, look, some of us have, have, alcohol, have alcoholic genes, and if we drink too much, regardless of what our childhoods are like, we are going to become alcoholics. But that, if we're trying to answer the question, if we're trying to answer the riddle, if we were to work on parenting strategies and really teach people, new parents, how to parent more effectively, more communication, be more connected, it would reduce the number of active addicts in the world over time. And it would shorten the amount of time that it takes for people to get sober. Because we take, we spend, you spend so much Client, we don't know. The cleanups, of, the cleanups of shit show. You spend just the amount of time you have to take them to be able to be present of themselves is so long. It takes people sometimes a long time just to be able to be present with their emotions, what they're doing, and how they affect people. We struggled with the dude with that recently, and mm-hmm. until he had that moment of clarity where he saw how he affected other people, he connected with how it made him feel, he was never able to stay sober. Would that take a month and a half? Here, plus the multitude of times before. <laughs> In the other treatment centers. <laughs> it, that's the key. Yeah. That's the first step you learn. It's the first thing you learn. <sighs> you can't do any work without somebody being able we, to We, at least present. this organization, I mean, we're focused on, we're focused on, on the damage repair. We take someone who has been, whose life has been disassembled by active For addiction. Reasons, yeah. And we try to help them. We create an environment where the healing process can happen. We guide them through the healing process. But... How do we as a community, I mean, yeah, it's parenting. It comes down to parenting. It's, it's, it would, this is my view and this is my opinion, both as, a, as an individual person and as a professional in the, in the uh, behavioral health space. I believe that a strong, focused education for parents using the most up-to-date statistics we have and the best methods we can come up with as inexpensively and widespread as possible so that new parents can learn better parenting habits. Mm -hmm. I think that would reduce the tidal wave of active addiction to a low roar. I I don't think we'll ever get rid of it. There are too many factors. Mm -hmm. But I think that would take this huge, this huge tidal wave down to something that's more manageable. We're losing north of 550 alcoholics and drug addicts a day. In a country. Just just here. Where everything's taken care of. Third world countries. their drug addiction problems are way that their communities are so much more connected. They got no, some of them. They got no more. They got no other choice but to be connected. Communities where people are connected, you see a lot lower rates of drug addiction. Communities where people right. are well, just Norway's a good example. They're a level four country, but they're you're right. They're much more connected. It's also a much smaller population, 
and, and drug addiction still exist. But, but nowhere near. They're not losing 500 of their citizens every 24 not hours. Not even in the same, you can't even no. put them in the same category as us. No. No, we're obviously a much larger country, but we have a, we have a very different culture, and we do things a lot differently. Even if you took the subsect of people in AA, if you let's make AA its own thing, how many people are we losing to drug addiction as it relates to the normal population? A lot less. This is a community of connected people. That's true. Twelve step fellowships, if you look at them as their own core ho cohort, because you have a lot of twelve step groups out there, right? There's AA, mm -hmm. CA, HA, churches, <clears throat> any group of people where people are connected. That statistic is going to it's going to plummet. Pl not drop. Drop is like a yeah. plummet's like fell off a cliff. <laughs> that statistic falls off a cliff. Literally falls off of a fucking cliff. And you're right. It's, it's, it's combating isolation. Connectedness. That is a long ass discussion about a simple question. But that's a, it's a hard, you can't, it's not a simple answer is the truth. That's, uh, that's correct. And there's a, anytime people, parents or other, um, people outside of the industry or outside of recovery kind of peer in and they ask questions. That's usually what I have to start with. I have to start with the caveat. I'm like, I, I can give you a short version, but you're asking what sounds like a simple question, but it's really complicated. So what you need to do is come in a morning clinical meeting and I'm gonna <laughs> you to sit down with 12 different people and all 12 of us are going to talk about one person <laughs> and we are going to put our heads together to try to come up with the best game plan that we can to help this person based off what we think is best for him. Is the answer. And based off of our assessments. <laughs> right. So, yeah, come to our morning clinical meeting and we'll put the whole team together and we can probably get close to giving you that. <laughs> yeah, when, I, when uh, we did that thing for, um, for all the occupational therapists over at that medical school, they wanted me to say something. And she's like, so how do you work with drug addicts? And I said, well, let me ask a question. <clears throat> when someone's released from detox, level one detox facility, they are basically not going to die in your care. And now you have them. Now you've got 30 to 90 days to figure out how to, how to release them to the world, balanced, healthy, integrated, and ready to live their lives and never do drugs again. Go. What do you do? And they all just kind of were like, uh, I said, well, that's what we do. The answer to that question is really complicated. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to walk it backwards. We have to unwind, reverse engineer an entire lifetime worth of dysfunction and try and figure out what's at the core, which knots can we untie, which ones are they brave enough, to, which challenges are they brave enough to face. It's complicated. And our ownership doesn't end there. Mm -mm. Ownership goes way beyond that in everything that we do. You know? This is good. We should do another one of these soon. I like it. It's great. I got a piece so bad. All right, man. Well, that's it for today. All right. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Later, bro.